Okay, and this evening's discussion is Buddhism and politics, ideology and praxis. And I should just start by saying that there are many misconceptions about Buddhism, uh, especially about American, by Americans. And among those is that it's pacifist, which of course it is not, and that Buddhism is apolitical, and of course that is not, and I'll be addressing that in just a moment. And it doesn't address the material room, the material world, and that is also wrong. So this presentation is one that I presented about two years ago with a few revisions. Uh, this topic is as important today as it was then. Um, and it's short because I want to encourage some discussion. And, and by the way, when I reuse these, it's because I, I think that it worked okay the first time, but better do it again. Um, because nobody's going to remember anyway, you know. Um, did you remember it, Mushi? No, Mushi doesn't. <laughs> and so, so you know, as the, as our saga gets older, I can I don't have to wait for two years before I redo the, the, the presentation. I can do it once every month because nobody's going to remember from the previous the previous time. The younger folks might have a problem with that, but for the older folks, it doesn't make any difference. And I'm going to preface, have a preface with this. And that is that Buddhism is an important ethical and religious tradition, even as if it is not explicitly incorporated into the political system. And despite this long history of connection between Buddhism and politics, Western scholarship in the 20th century went through two phases. Um, an early phase, strongly influenced by Max Weber, which saw Buddhism as being either apolitical or even anti-political, and focused solely on releasing practitioners from the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, samsara. In a later phase, in which Western scholars began to study the political writings and history of Buddhism more carefully, revealing both the normative political ideas in the Buddhist traditions and the complex practice of politics by Buddhists and in the name of Buddhism. Thus, the earlier controversy over whether Buddhism contains any political ideas at all has been replaced by more nuanced debates about how to interpret the primary text that do overtly discuss things like kings and laws about whether those texts reflect normative preference for monarchy or republicanism, and about the future direction of Buddhist political thinking. Today, the perception is as complicated as, as it ever was because Buddhism has always had a socio-cultural component and there is no Buddhism, only Buddhisms. That is to say, Buddhism is not singular, it is plural and therefore some schools of Buddhism have a view and other schools of Buddhism have another view. In addition to that, modern Buddhism in Asia is a reaction to colonial and modernist forces. So that's important to remember. So this is a, a quote from uh, Zhao Qialu. Buddhists in the West are pushing towards becoming more politicized, which generally means protesting government policies. This was written during Trump and advocating for human rights and environmental protection. Meanwhile, Buddhists in China are resisting the political politicization of their religion, which amounts to supporting the communist regime. And in, in China today, that's a, that's a real issue. So can you be a Trump supporter and a Buddhist? Hold that question. <laughs> okay. Okay. So politics has always been part of Buddhism from the historical perspective. The Buddha came from a warrior caste and was naturally brought into association with kings, princes, and ministers. And in the realm of political practice, since the time of the historical Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, Buddhism has both influenced governments and been identified by governments as a source of their authority and legitimacy. And to a very large extent, religion. And it, religion 
writ large, not just Buddhism, but religion writ large, really has been used by political figures, whether we're talking about monarchies, republics, democracies, or whatever, um, for their own ends in which to provide them legitimacy. And in the United States today, we think about evangelical Christians in relation to um, Republican politics, most specifically. Um, so the Nikaya Triptaka contains numerous references to and discussions with kings, princes, wars, and policies. Two of the most significant sutras dealing with might, what might loosely be described as political responsibility are the Kakra Vashita Shanda Sutta and the Agana Sutta, Sutta is plural. Uh, these texts treat the origin and development of the state and the rights and duties of both monarchs and citizens. The model society and political polity they present and fosters ethical conduct and embodies a strong social ideal, which then guides the principal objectives of the state. And Buddhist monarchies have ruled Buddhist majority realms across Southeast and East Asia at various times over the past 2000 years. And even today, many nations in Asia understand their governments to have a duty to rule in a way that is consistent with Buddhist values. And then there are also Buddhist monarchies that violate Buddhist values by suppressing religious and ethnic minorities and enabling nations in their pursuit of imperialism and warfare. So if you, if you want to think about, well, when did this really begin? Ashoka, 200 BCE, created a Buddhist state. And so his teachings were explicitly based upon Buddhist values that were being implemented. Unfortunately, the Ashokan, or called the Mauryan Empire, didn't last very long because he also thought it was not a good idea to have a military. And so the next door neighbors who didn't share Buddhist values took advantage of that. Let's look at some pre-modern ideology. And the Mahayana canon, likewise, contains advice to rulers about how to govern well, warning about the dire consequences of ruling poorly, and admonitions to avoid arrogance and ignoring the needs of the common people. In Japan, as an example, Kuroda Toshio developed the Kenmon theory, which is a synthetic interpretation of ruling structures. And they looked at the power of religious institutions in pre modern Japan. And Kuroda argued, for an approach that recognizes the leading Buddhist temples as legitimate co-rulers of the modern, pre-modern Japanese realm. Buddhism was a state religion until the mid 19th century and exercised considerable power. And it should be noted that the Meiji Restoration in Japan, which occurred, uh, like I said, mid 19th century, uh, 1858 was the beginning of the restoration. And by 1872, it had fully taken place and was, was fully in, in place. And it should be noted that the Meiji Restoration in Japan eliminated, eliminated that Kenmon structure in Japan. And many scholars submit that this contributed to the imperialist Japan. In many other Asian nations, Buddhism is an important ethical and religious tradition even if it is not explicitly incorporated into the political system. Current ideologies. There is an inherent problem of trying to intermingle religion with politics. The basis of religion is morality, purity, and faith, while that of politics is power. And in the course of history, religion has often been used to give legitimacy to those in power and their exercise of that power. When religion is used to pander, let me restate that, to pander, because I don't get to use pander very often, to pander to political whims, it has to forego its high moral ideals and come be, become debased by worldly political demands. The thrust of Buddha Dharma is not directed to the creation of new political institutions and establishing political arrangements. Basically, it seeks to approach the problems of society 
by reforming the individuals constituting that society and by suggesting some general principles through which society can be guided toward greater humanism, improved welfare of its members, and more equitable sharing of resources. And this particular picture is the Chinese parliament. And in China, the Chinese government has taken into the government as ministers, as representatives, um, Chinese Buddhist monks, uh, as well as Roman Catholic priests. And there's sort of a dual structure between the Vatican and Chinese Roman Catholicism. There's a dual structure between Tibetan Buddhism, which is located in Dharamsala, uh, the, the, the people who took refuge to India during the 1950s, late 1950s, and also those Buddhist monks who choose to cooperate with the government. And so that's one example. In Japan, we have the case of Kamito, which is a party which is actually an offshoot of Soka Gakkai. And they have representatives to the Japanese diet, the Japanese parliament. Uh, and they tend to be very nationalist, uh, pro-nationalist party. And of course, from a, an American perspective, we think of the separation of the church and the state. And in principle, Buddhism remains ready to offer political guidance and criticism without seeking theocratic power or adherence to any type of dogmatic fundamentalism. And we have examples, for instance, of the Dalai Lama, who is both a spiritual head as well as a uh, civil leader within Tibet before they were taken over by China. Um, and we have uh, theocracies in Thailand today, Sri Lanka, Burma. So it's there, the notion of separation of church and state sometimes works more in um, principle than in reality. As Robert Bella pointed out, Modernization is not simply a matter of adopting new technologies. It also involves a moral, more, excuse me, a modernization of the soul. In early 20th century Asia, Buddhists often adopted concepts imported from the West, such as social welfare or socialism, and adapted them to their own countries, circumstances, and endowed them with distinctive indigenous vigor. Among other issues Buddhists must grapple with are rampant consumerism and the deluge of Western popular culture and political tyranny, often supported or simply ignored by the international community. It's no exaggeration to claim that Buddhism in contemporary Asia means energetic engagement with social and political issues and crises, at least as much as it means monastic or meditative withdrawal. And that's a quote from Queen. We can make the same appeal in America today. An ideal. <laughs> the ideal of democracy in the West, with its emphasis on process, inclusiveness, and human dignity, is imbued with many of the qualities and insights of the Dharma. And that's according to David Kaczynski. And I'll, I'll say something about him in a moment. Uh, I will provide a lengthy quote from David Kaczynski, who is the executive director of the New Yorkers Against the Death Penalty. He and his wife, Linda Patrick, received national attention in 1996 when it, re when it was revealed that, it is, that David's brother, Theodore, known as the Unabomber, oh. was turned in by his own family. David is an Ichiren Buddhist who at the time lived in Schenectady, New York. As Buddhists, we also understand that there, and this is a quote from David, as Buddhists, we also understand that there is no truth or wisdom without compassion. Engaged Buddhists represent an antidote to the politics of fear, hate, violence, and separation. We realize that on the path to enlightenment, no one is left behind. Practice and study helps us avoid the traps of polarized thinking. We resist war, yet we honor the soldier's pain and sacrifice. We oppose the death penalty, yet we open our hearts to murder victims' family members. We know that truth and transformation can be realized through listening and paying attention, as well as 
through speaking and taking action. We are the ones who don't turn our heads away, who abide without discouragement, and to avoid becoming a mirror image of the enemy, because in the end, we have no enemies. Can there be a true, truly democratic politics without Dharma in the broad sense? Is there anything more needed in public life than the Dharma? And I'm going to end this discussion portion right here, and then go to questions, comments, and thoughts. So. Glenn has a hand. Glenn, please go ahead. Yes. Um, actually, this is pertaining. I, I kind of want to add something here. Um, pertaining to that last slide you had there about um, about how uh, about democracy, about how um, it's imbued with a lot of uh, elements from the Dharma. Actually, I don't know if you know this, but actually, you know that. Did you know that democracy, the, the whole concept of democracy, actually came from the East. It came from like roughly about from the same origins of you know of the Dharma you know of the, of the Dharmic uh, traditions. It, it came from uh, democracy. Came from you know from from, in, from India, Nepal area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What, what questions do we have? I thought there'd be a lot of questions on this. Nobody's got any. Yeah, questions. I have a question. Oh, oh, okay. Now we got now, now we got a lot of questions. So go ahead, Mushi. Yeah, well, uh, the polarization and uh, in politics is extreme. Without and, a doubt. <laughs> and that Buddhist. Okay. But I'm not, yeah, no, it's it's not Buddhist. At the same time, the polarization is not caused by Buddhism. I didn't say it. No. no, I realize you didn't, but I'm just saying that you can't equate the polarization that we have and say, well, that Buddhist will know. But can Buddhists do something about it? Buddhists individually can do something about it, and we can contribute to less if we choose to. But the question is, how how much can we do about it? That's, that's really the issue. I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's and, and I would I would suggest that some of the very basic notions about it that are exist within Buddhism, such as inner penetration, if it were accepted by a wider audience, would actually seek to reduce that polarization because then we wouldn't see the individual as the sole arbiter of what the society should do. We wouldn't be ruled by a minority, which is what we're being ruled by today in the United States as an example. David. I somebody have a parsing question. Could you go back to your first slide? I'm not <laughs> sure I understand one thing here. It says, meanwhile, Buddhists in China are resisting the politicization of the religion, which amounts to supporting the Irish regime. So I'm confused. Yeah. Well, are they resisting, no, are they that. supporting the communist regime? Or by resisting, are they saying the politicization? Uh, they're resisting. The pol they're regime. resisting politi politicization, meaning they are not being political, which in fact then supports the communist regime. Rather than rather than um, resisting certain pol okay. policies by the communist regime, they're not resisting certain policies by the communist. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Jao's writing can be a little bit. Mean? Well, no, it, it, I think I just explained it. it. It means that in China, Buddhists are resisting being politicized. They're saying, no, 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 we can't be political. We have to, it's all about being at peace with oneself. Yeah. That then gives greater agency to the central government to enact policies which are detrimental to minorities, all, all kinds of things. Yeah, Uyghurs. Uyghurs, et cetera. Pass it up to Trump. Okay, can, can you, okay, here's an interesting, uh, Craig had asked, can you be a Buddhist and a Trump supporter? And that's a really great question. Uh, and it depends upon a number of factors, whether you think you can or can't, but, what was really interesting to me is when I was 
I revised this for the last time. For one thing, I had, instead of the picture of Bernie, I had a picture of Trump there, sitting as a Buddha and talking about his ego, that he has the least ego of anybody he knows. <laughs> um, and and so, um, so when I was doing re revising this, I came across at least a half a dozen, maybe more, uh, articles by people who had been Republicans, you know, had voted for Bush and for other people previous to Trump, but specifically did not vote for Trump in 2016 or 2020, and specifically resisted those policies. They said, I've remained, a re I remain a Republican, but I can't in good conscience support policies which are antithetical to Buddhist teachings. So from that, I might include, not really. <laughs> you can't support Trump and be a, and be a Buddhist, I, just from that small sample, for what it's worth. I mean, that's anecdotal, but, you know. Um, I think that the Joe had his, his hand up earlier, and then Jake, and then Sagan. Yeah, Moshe says, I have two related questions, and my concern is by the time I finish asking the second question, you and I may forget the first question. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, let me try. So, um, right, Tendai Buddhism uh, assumes diversity of uh, humanity, right? uh, different people have different uh, dispositions, uh, way, ways of thinking, hence we have to use the uh, skillful means and so forth. And, and so, uh, so pl pluralism is given. And so what, what can we discuss? So can you, can you, dis can you, can we discuss the, uh, how do I say, the boundary of political diversity within Tendai Buddhism, you know, without becoming relativist, relativist. Right? Right. So right. that's que question number one. I, <laughs> Oh, que oh, question well, number question number two is something that is well this is it in a way the other side of the same coin and related to something that you said earlier right each of us can wear different hats so i can say something as job jindo i can say something as a scholar of biblical religion i can say something as japanese and so i i so potentially i you can be a buddhist and support I don't know, um, this Republican candidate or Democrat uh, uh, candidate, candidate from the other party. But as a Buddhist, as a Tendai Buddhist, will there be a moment that you, you say, as a Buddhist, as a Tendai Buddhist, I have to support this candidate? So it, it's right. I, I would say no. And so I'll answer the second one first. And like you say, we might forget the first question. But I would say that the answer to the second question is, no, it's not a matter of candidates. You might support candidate A instead of candidate B because you feel strongly on, let's say, the environment. And candidate B has a terrible record on the environment. Candidate A has a great record on the environment. So I think right. you have to look at the individual right. issue and make a decision. But I would never endorse a particular candidate. But earlier, did you not say that, you know, um, being a Buddhist and a Trump supporter are uh, oxymoron? <laughs> but it's based, it's based upon the policies. <clears throat> yeah, so what I meant was a policy, policy. Yeah. 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 This candidate they, they, uh, with this set of policies. Right. right. I, I think you... Yeah, go ahead. No, I am... I, I think that you can always look and make your decision about who one supports from a, a, a campaign political perspective, uh, the, the political in the more direct uh, relationship, but, you, but it's based upon the actions of the person. It's not based upon the person, him or herself. Uh, and, do you, and you are saying that, how do I say this? And that this... The choice is informed by your Buddhist worldview and Buddhist values. That's right. Okay. That's what I'm saying. So if we're talking, if we're talking about the notion of of 
how you treat one another, how we, uh, you know, indiv- how we treat in- individuals, each other, then how does that particular political candidate address that? That's a, that's a Buddhist, that has Buddhist interest, okay? And the, well, the first question had to do with plurality. And Tendai, and, and I don't remember what the first question was, you're no, right. No, no, diversity, political diversity, the limits of, the limits of political uh, diversity within a, a Buddhist tradition, in this case, uh, Tendai Buddhism. Well, I, I can tell you that there is a person who was, I don't, I don't know what he is now, but I know that he was a very strong Trump supporter and he was certainly welcome within the Hondo. He got into some arguments with some of the Sangha members because the, most of our Sangha, by the way, tends to be slightly left of Che Guevara, <laughs> whereas this fellow was, was very much a Trump supporter. And... On the other hand, he then chose to come on Tuesday nights by himself to sit in the hondo. And I encouraged it, and I would meet with him. Uh, and we would have a conversation, not about politics, but I tried to support him as a person, even though his political perspective was ideologically 180 degrees from my own. I, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Um, Jake had his hand up. Yeah, so uh, a few things. So um, the first thing is that I remember seeing an article somewhere. It was probably in Tricycle. And it was talking about um, the political statistics when it comes to Buddhists in North America. And it said that I believe the percentage was 98%. Uh, tend to support be more left leaning, and then the remaining percent end up being more right leaning. And so, statistically, ninety eight percent of people in that room there are pro- <laughs> are left leaning, and you're gonna have to sp- spend the rest of the night trying to figure out who the other two people. Are. As I look around, I suspect it might be closer to a hundred percent. Anyways, um, no, but. Uh, but I think there's a good reason for that too, which is that you know, as somebody who has Wait, we can't we can't hear you, Jake. You oh. is that better now? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, I think there's a a reason for that though, because um, you know, as somebody who has been involved in various political campaigns and took political science in high school and very politically active, um, what I find is that people, and I think the psychological studies seem to kind of go along with this too, that people who are more right-leaning tend to favor tradition, whereas people on the left are a little bit more open-minded to to new things. And so I don't think it's really a surprise that most Buddhists in North America are going to end up being left-leaning because it takes a certain kind of, um, it's a certain kind of, I'm going to use the word courage maybe, to go against the kind of views that other people in your society might hold. And so th- that's the first thing that I want to say is, is because I think that that's an important thing to take into consideration. And then the other thing is that I, I have a lot of, um, I'm always getting friend requests because of different Buddhist groups um, on Facebook. I'm always getting friend requests from different monks or priests and things like that. And a few of them I have seen who were definitely like Trump supporters. And actually recently there was one who's a Tendai priest who is from Russia and was a very uh, big, a big uh, supporter of Vladimir Putin. And, He's no longer on Facebook now, but that's another story. But um, so I, th- I think that it's a it's a complicated issue, and I think what I would say is somebody who has spent many years involved in political things of, of various kinds, I've seen people on both sides who have been absolutely incredible people, and I've also seen people on both sides who have been terrible people. And I would just say to try to look at the the character of each individual and to try to look past any political differences because even if there's something that you politically disagree with sometimes you'll find that the person the the place that they're approaching it from might be a place of compassion or or something of that nature even if it doesn't seem like that all the time thank you and we're going to do say again and then mushin and then david so good evening to add to what just jacob just said 
I have a very good friend who is a Buddhist and who is a hundred percent Trump supporter. And uh, I've had many conversations with this friend. <laughs> and uh, from what I have gathered, my belief is that his support for this for Trump is predicated on a serious lack of knowledge on certain things or just uh, <laughs> fallen fallen for uh, propaganda from various news organizations. I'm not going to name names. But this person is still a Buddhist and he is a Buddhist in everything he does. So there are uh, MAGA uh, Buddhists out there. <laughs> it's just very weird to deal with them. I just wanted to give that that opinion of mine. To, to paraphrase someone else, who some people here will know who I'm talking about, um, never underestimate the delusion that people can have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. That's that's important to remember. Mushin. Yeah, uh, during the rise of Japanese imperialism, nationalism, uh, emperor worship, mm -hmm. and colonialism, mm -hmm. and, and colonialism. What was the stance of Tendai? Tendai era. Tendai, well, let me, let me start by saying that there were several things going on, and to put it into a context would take an entire evening just to take a series of discussions just for that. That's a that's a study that I've that I've actually done, not just about Tendai, but Buddhism in Japan at yeah. that time. And so when you read Brian Victoria, for instance, for instance, uh, now I'll get to that in a second. After the Meiji Restoration, Buddhism was delegitimized in Japan. There were actually temples that were burned, there were priests that were tossed out of the temples, etc. And so this was at the same time. That's what I was referring to. There's some scholars that say that the imperialism in Japan was at least a contributing factor was the fact that Buddhism had been taken out of the Japanese uh, consciousness. We'll put it that way. Formally taken out of the Japanese consciousness. And the so you had, you had the temples who were struggling to survive. And one of the ways that several of them, several of different schools, um, meant to survive was we're going to become nationalistic so we, sh we can show that we're going to play ball, which has often been what Buddhists have done with monarchies and uh, emperors, etc. They've, they've been complicit in some of those things. And so, for instance, Soto Zen, some of the Soto Zen founders of the Zen schools in America were anti-Semitic. They were pro-war. They were absolutely, you know, and I, I refer to Brian Victoria, Zen at War and Zen Writings uh, at War. That's the, the two books that he wrote on the subject. When you look at, at um, uh, World War II and you look at um, um, Jodo Shinshu, they tended also to be very pro-nationalistic. Tendai, you would, because Tendai, temples tend to be a little bit more autonomous than some of the other schools. I, there was a broader notion of who was going to be supporting the war effort, who wasn't going to be supporting the war effort. There wasn't a as formal a Tendai attitude toward it as there was like a Soto Zen attitude toward it. And so in general, they tended to be a bit more neutral. And there were some, there were, there were Nichiren priests who were uh, executed because they they were not complicit in the war activities. Um, I don't know. It, it's a sense that you might have a better a better feel for that since you were uh, a child during that period of time. How would you how would you characterize Tendai's attitude toward uh, the Great Pacific War? Well, the. Uh... Mm. I, I know I'm giving you, I'm throwing you an easy one, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't like politics, but uh, when I was a child, uh, you know, just uh, that was the end of the World War II. 
And uh, I remember uh, my father had to go to uh, um, military yeah, and uh, my grandfather was worried about that uh, very much. And anyhow, uh, such, you know, the uh, politics is very important and but very difficult uh, to think from the Buddhist side. Uh, well, the um, mage restoration, it was uh, really terrible. And uh, uh, most of the Buddhist temples are collapsed. And the, but at the same time, uh, the American leaders like uh, uh, William Stadis Vigero, and they came to uh, Japan in the middle of the uh, Meiji period. And uh, they really interested in Buddhist culture. And uh, so uh, William Stadis Vigero himself became a Tendai Buddhist monk. And he he was a founder, one of the founders of uh, uh, museum uh, in uh, the you know the very famous museum I forgot. Anyway, Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, Boston Museum, yes. And uh, he has collected uh, many uh, items of Buddhist uh, cultures to there, uh, because he worried about uh, you know the politics of uh, Japan at that time. Most of the uh, people, uh, they and you know, uh, many uh, people came from from Europe and the other countries to get Buddhist items almost free, of uh, free. And uh, at that time, um, you know, even five story the pagoda and Kofukuji Temple in Nagu uh, in Nara. It was selling uh, uh, twenty thousand yen, uh, current you know uh, current uh, um, value, and so uh, many many Buddhist uh, uh, structures and uh, Buddha images were uh, really stolen and maybe damaged by the government. It but a uh, <coughs> American <coughs> such you know. <coughs> person, uh, they helped, I think, uh, uh, Buddhist culture during the such major restorations and really appreciate uh, William Stagis Vigero and others uh, to protect uh, Buddhist items out of- Thank you, Sen Thank you Sensei. David, you had your hand up. I just wanted to say that I appreciated what Jake had to say. Uh, and the, the acknowledgement that there are a wide variety of uh, political positions, even within Buddhism, because I, I am, I suppose, the, the one person out of the hundred that is going to diverge on certain topics. I'm certainly not a Trump fan, but I definitely lean conservative. And I've struggled at times in listening to some of the conversations to find where my viewpoints mesh with uh, my faith and it's it's good to know that there is room for it um out there and that there's some understanding of that thank you david and i and i think that, that to put a finer point on it um it's only through discussion that we can evolve and create a better society if we don't discuss those issues then it'd be it you know to be candid with you we can look at the while many of us, I said, were, were slightly left, left of Che Guevara, some of us are a lot left of Che Guevara, but we have to remember that there are um, abuses committed by those on the left, as well as the abuses that were committed by those on the right. I mean, you know, the, the Russian Revolution was a leftist revolution. What did they do? They slaughtered the, fam the royal family. You know, of of Russia, the white well, Russian. You know, I think the, there's a level of of understanding that needs to be out there. That you know, you can have the same goals and different orientations as how to reach them. Uh, just because you know you have different viewpoints doesn't mean you're you're not reaching for the same goals. 
I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Same intention. Thank you. Yes, John, John first. I was going to say, I, earlier today, I finished reading uh, a book called Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet mm -hmm. by Thich Nhat Hanh. It was also it's a collection of his writings and talks and also people who were close to him who, who contributed essays. And a lot of the, the book is about communities, building communities and how they do things at Plum Village and how they resolve issues and so on and that kind of thing. But I was surprised how much of the book is really about calming the mind and finding a place of compassion to then go out and exert, uh, you know, then and to then go and have conversations with other people. And one of the topics that he mentioned that struck me was what he called mindful listening. And he talked about that in the context of, you know, you're not talking about agreeing with somebody, but you're taught necessarily, but you're talking about being able to listen in such a way, to make listening a practice, mm -hmm. to listen in such a way that you can understand who this person <laughs> is that you're listening to and what it is that they believe and what it is that they think, regardless of how you feel about it. Right. And I think that that is a very valuable perspective to have in these polarized times that we've been describing. I was going to say, and maybe that speaks to more about why, why is there polarization? I think there's an inherent defensiveness that, that blocks the listening of other people. I agree. Mm -hmm. and, and, and actually, David Lloyd talks about that, about that notion. So, yes, just one look, Mushi and then question. David, and then, we're, then we got to yeah. move on. Uh, so, what is, uh, what is the Buddhist view about Abortion. It depends and upon which Buddhist and the politics. The, which and Buddhist the, school you're talking about? Tibetan Buddhists are very similar to Roman Catholic, you know. and uh, but on the other hand, in Japan, you know, my my attitude has always been. So I'll just speak about this Buddhist attitude toward abortion: is abortion is 100 percent wrong, and a woman's right to choose, a woman's inability to choose is 100% wrong. You have two, two difficult things. And so I always said, if a woman chooses to have an abortion, it's between her, her doctor, the family, and the, the male. And it's not my position one way or the other. It's their position. And if a person chooses to have the baby, I'll do a blessing. If they choose to have an abortion, I'll do a memorial for the fetus. Okay. That's, and does and I have an official? Yeah, that's pretty much stance. it. Okay. Yeah, that's why you see Jesus on the countryside mm -hmm. all over the place. Yeah. Right, on the one hand, it, 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 it is a death, but bringing, bringing life right. into an unjust situation is equally... Right. Well, mine's really quick. Okay. Because I think this takes us to a future talk. We're discussing here Buddhism and politics. And I think we can come to some sort of agreement on what is Buddhism. But we actually stopped to ask what is a Buddhist? We, yeah, we ask it all the time. And you're right. That's a good topic for next month. What is a Buddhist? And if you don't wear the right hat, by the way, David, it's <laughs> if you don't wear the right hat, you can't be let in the club. Uh, and by the way, if I haven't shown you the handshake, <laughs> yeah. that was the elbow rope. That's the elbow rope. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate. And we're going to let the people in the, in the house go on into the hondo. And I'll take over today in, in the house. I'll be the Zoomer.